Yes, we'll be talking about the unfortunate incident in Ibadan. Now, we've got Mr. Fatari Woshini joining us this morning. He's the security advisor to the governor of Oyo State and former commissioner of police in Lagos and Benue State. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, this is um, it's really unfortunate that things have you know, gone this bad. But could you just give us an insight into, uh, because there are those who say, look, that several groups have had disagreements before. It didn't get this bad. But this one, people are still trying to figure out how did it degenerate to this level? Because many don't know, yes, that that might have happened. But you don't know how else some of these things may turn out tomorrow. So could you just tell us, what is the current situation? How did we get here? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chamberlain. Um, very unfortunate, very sad incident as well. Um, the narrative had been put out there, the immediate cause, um, the issue of um, the card pusher, uh, the people they call Mebaru, who had um, dumped tomato in front of the shop of a pregnant woman. and. Um, while in the process of cleaning the thing up, the pregnant woman had said, oh, come, you cannot mess up uh, the front of my shop. Come and pack everything and tidy up the place. And in the process, the car pusher um, had pushed the pregnant woman um, who fell. And um, another person standing by uh, approached the fellow. Don't you know this woman? is pregnant. And the next thing um, from the story I witnessed was that uh, this fellow used um, something like um, a ring, which they believed um, was a chance ring, to beat the, um, the third party that had intervened. And um, in the process, the guy um, started emitting a foam uh, from his mouth Unfortunately, um, while they were making preparations as they used to do in the market to see how they can solve it, um, the, uh, the, this fellow unfortunately died. And uh, that led to um, what we had uh, witnessed, a, a, a day of violence. Um, but above um, all what has been narrated, it's not the first time we've had it before. In different places, not just in the Southwest, even in the North, that you have this issue of uh, citizenship and settler. But the bottom line, um, from my perception, which everyone must agree to, is the deep-seated animosity um, between um, different ethnic groups in Nigeria. And um, I, I believe that it is high time that we start looking at that. We've always, you know, scratched the surface. Um, so, that deep-seated animosity um, surely escalates um, the whole of what happened. And that is where people turned into, um, you know, using people that you can call mercenaries. Uh, because interacting with the people in Shasha, the people in the market, you will hear from the main traders who keep, who keep on saying, we don't want this to happen. We've been in this market for a very long time. And the leaders in the market, both sides, also keep on saying that, look, all these guys that um, are foiling the trouble are not part of us in this market. But it is easy to say these guys are not part of us in the market. How did they get into the market? Um, why is it that they've not been able to manage them? But um, whether we like it or not, the fundamental issue is that uh, how do we address this deep-seated animosity um, that is fueling ethnic crisis, that is fueling religious crisis? We should um, just look at it holistically and not, um, you know, scratch the, the surface. But that's uh, my view about it. Well, um, again, uh one, one cannot even explain this in any, any sensible way whatsoever. One fatality is bad enough. But um, if you can just give us a few figures uh, on the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning, we have uh, 
it right there that 20 people uh, died, were buried as a result of this uh, fracas, and uh, 5,000 people have taken refuge. Uh, can you give us some figures, Maybe if that could yeah. help you put this in context? Uh, let, let me tell you, it is not a time to be given figure, not at this moment. And of course, um, any reportage in the media that is giving figure, we should be careful. Um, it is um, uh, a little bit uh, tense, um, and of course, um, the way we report things shouldn't be the way things we um, that we escalate um, things. Um, it is bad or worse enough that we've had this unfortunate incident, um, but. Um, doing things that could further escalate, that could further lead to um, more death, we should avoid it. Um, investigation, you know, everybody is putting heads together, the leaders there, um, the law enforcement um, agents. So it's, uh, it's really hard now to say this is exactly what has happened. Because as of last night, um, Meetings are still being held, and uh, it is not when a mop up operation is done that uh, we can be say, okay, this is um, what could be an estimate um, of um, properties that were lost or lives that were lost. Well, in in the spirit of uh, trying to ensure that this does not happen again, I remember you know we had this uh, conversation along this line um, uh, when you talk about. Uh, tensions between ethnic nationalities that have lived peacefully and harmoniously together for years, decades, you know, um, nipping them in the bud to ensure that this does not happen again. It will seem like, even though unconnected, as you said, the animosity, the deep-seated animosities found a way to rate unfortunate, ugly head in this occurrence that we have had. So... In terms of making sure this does not happen again, what is the thinking? You remember, we, we, I, I asked that question the last time that, look, it's happened in Ibarakwa or Okeogo. Uh, what's the assurance that it's not going to happen elsewhere? And then this, no one expects that these things will happen, but then they will happen occasionally. Deep-seated animosities, clearly. How do we nip it in the bud? What's the plan? What's the thinking? Uh, thank you very much. You can't nip it in the bud if we don't come with sincerity on the table. We are shying away from the fact that we are getting far and far divided in this country. It is not just me. Um, you know I've always emphasized something. A nation that don't know its history. If you don't have institutional memory, when I was in Lagos, we had this in my 12. We had it in Nigeria. In Bauchi, it happened. They didn't fool anything. Well, the houses element and Fulani element, um, you know, went to work to say that, look, in Tidin Fulani, um, we have more of houses. Why is it that Fulani had always been the head? You have it in the state. You have it in, in, in Plateau State. You have it just north would never do things with uh, the Bureau and all those things. So we must first accept that. We are shying away from that. The people that are ruling us are shying away from that. And the, one of the ways that I believe that this can be solved is that we've always um, emphasized and look at um, how to address uh, the, the issues that come under Chapter 4 of the uh, Constitution, which is the fundamental rights, because they are justiciable. It is not until when we march chapter four of the constitution with chapter two. We must live true to chapter two of the constitution that are provided some obligations. We've always said that they are non-justiciable, but these provisions, um, I believe, could solve some of this problem. People have been talking of um, um, let's separate um, and all those things. We, we must come to the fact that somehow there must be involvement of powers. Somehow, the government must be responsible. The people, the citizens must be responsible. Every, um, you know, um, uh, sector of the community, if you look deeply into that uh, chapter two of the Constitution, 
fundamental objectives and right to principles of state policy. Quite a number of um, measures were provided there as any of the government lived up to that responsibility. And they've taken advantage of the fact that they said those principles are non justiciable. That is it. Um, every governor will also come out to say, oh, um, we, we should have state police. Some people have said, uh, said we should even have local government police. If we can't have all these things immediately, um, should we, why should we shy away even from the constitution that are provided for police council? Where all the governors of the country are supposed to be members, they're supposed to deliberate on how policing is done, uh, a lot of power is given to that, um, uh, that uh, unit, that's the police council. It is in the constitution, but we've not lived up to that. So any country that doesn't follow institutional memory, that are jettisoned um, exchange rules and regulations, which supposed to bind us together, will continue to have this kind of a thing. We, we shouldn't be scratching the surface. We should be able to solve all these problems holistically. Otherwise, they will continue to repeat itself and we'll continue to reinvent the way. Well, you know, um, you, we all need to ask ourselves questions and not lie to ourselves. Because if we do, I mean, we'll all, they'll know that. Whoever lies to himself will know that that is a lie. But you at a vantage position. By that, I mean, having been commissioner of police in different states and been in the service for a long time and now advising on security as well. You've seen several incidences related to this, some of which you've highlighted. And in terms of addressing these problems, I mean, when you say deep-seated animosity, can we as a country actually address these things? Um, because some will say, look, where do we start? How do we begin to structure it or institutionally begin to address them? And speaking about institutions, because you expect that when security agencies wade into a matter, people are supposed to shift their sword and trust them to do the right things. But at the moment, it appears as if that is missing. That even when security agencies step in, people still don't feel they should let go because they think they won't get justice. Does that come across to you that way? And if so, look, how do we address that? You know, when I said um, deep seated animosity, it's not just about ethnic and religion alone, even against um, the institutions, even amongst the members of the institutions that wear uniform. Sometimes sentiment um, come in. I have witnessed it before. I saw it in Bauchi, where even people that are wearing uniform, we've introduced a lot of things into our system that are dangerous. It is now that you have a um, situation where some group of people will say, oh, the chief of army staff should come from um, my area. The inspector general of police should come from my area. Um, of course, before independence, the, the, the colonial masters, and immediately after independence, all these things are not there. You cannot go to a police station and see a DPO putting a calendar um, to put where is shown that is the chairman of one uh, um, Yoruba something group or whatever. All of us that were in uniform believe that we won. But now, even in the institution, you now see people, you know, gathering together. And of course, when I talked of um, addressing issues holistically, more and more people are, are, are being, you know, taken out of job. There are so many um, uh, soldiers of employed people. And when even we want to do palliatives, we do it in an um, um, elitist manner. Uh, have we reached out to some of these hands? It's, it's shameful that our leaders, yes, all of us are involved, but the people that have been given, you know, that authority to rule us that have voted for, it's, it's just shameful that everybody will come out and say that people are coming from Niger, people are coming from Chad, people are coming from Mali, and they're the people that are causing this. Who host them in the community? Why can't we do something to our border? If you know that these foreigners are coming, um, what have we done 
to stop it? What have we even done to address the, 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 the issue of poverty? It is all over. It's, you know, we are facing it. We, we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder. A lot of people are out there that any opportunity, every opportunity they have, they want something to happen so that they can loot shops. We had the NSAS is still ongoing, what, which turned to almost a class war. And um, everybody says that we're speaking English grammar, we would um, uh, talk of, uh, we want to part, we want to do this. Unfortunately, the elders, the elderly people that sat down then to say, oh, Nigeria should be one. They are the same people that are saying that, oh, everyone should go in his own way. Is, is that a solution? Let us address this holistically. Um, the people that have been trusted with power must be sincere enough. And um, we must also realize that um, government and governance are things that should continue. Not everybody tying um, whatever measures to the tenure of uh, its administration. We, we've not been sincere to ourselves uh, from the benefit of hindsight, from what I've also seen in, in the service. We must push even the service of ethnic uh, bigotry even in the service, the uniform service, all the uniform service, you, you have a group of people that will say, because the Inspector General of Police is from um, our own um, ethnic group, the chief of staff or the chief of numbers of um, groups. Fiefdoms are created. And unfortunately, the people that get the powers pretend not to see all these things, that people are forming fiefdom under them. And that is why you have that. And that is why the trust is also not there again, that when you want to deploy a military, when you want to deploy a police, the people in the community will first say that, oh, the military is dominated by the North, um, the police is dominated by the South, or uh, this one is so dominated by the Southeast or something like that. So it's uh, security is a matter of perception. If you're going to a doctor and you already think that that doctor cannot save you, you, you would have this feeling of the doctor cannot heal me. So when people have that mistrust that you are the people you are deployed are not part of us, you, you see them the resisting, the resentment will come in. And of course, once that has come in, you have already destroyed everything. We must build strong institutions that will leave to the um, enabling laws that established them. But the people that have been ruling have been shy, um, you know, they're, they're shy of this. The people that are in the National Assembly, they are shy of this. So we, we just talk of mundane things, not the real issues that have been causing problems. You've said, what can we do for this not to happen? If we don't address the issue of sincerity, equity, fair play, justice in all the facets of our life, as stated in that chapter two of the constitution, we are wasting our, our time. Everybody is just to himself, it's personal interest. If you remember, if we have institutional memory, um, prior to 2015, 2015 loading, we had this kind of a thing, Campbell, everybody said Nigeria would not exist in 2019. And why is it that when elections are approaching, you have all this, it's because the people that um, have been given custody um, to rule us are not sincere. 2015, everybody said, oh, Nigeria will not stand, and all those things. And this is the same thing loading. We're approaching 2019. This is the second year of um, most of the government. Um, before you know it, towards the end of the year, and next year, politicking will start. And when it is started, this is what we do. Um, it is also a wake-up call for all Nigerians that um, if we continue to sit down and allow people to toggle us around, we would not get there. Yeah. And, I mean, because my... a lot of the people who beat these drums of war, they usually, they will never be in the front lines. And before you say Jack Robinson, they're out of the vicinity. They have the ways of ensuring that they're out of the scene even before it starts. But... Um, I mean, our markets now, I mean, a lot of markets look like that. The, no particular format, no real structure. 
things are really fluid in terms of how uh, the traders there mingle with one another. So speaking about low hanging, low hanging fruits, uh, what steps are being taken to ensure that, first of all, uh, let's stop this and ensure that anyone who tries to do anything doesn't succeed? Is the state government, uh, what plans are there other than uh, declaring curfew, a lot of things to come because the nature of markets, this could just, uh, you know, happen again. So what are we, what's the thinking to ensure that, uh, well, whenever the market is reopened, this will not happen? Um, thank you very much. Uh, a kind of, um, you know, robust meeting, an initial one, um, was um, held by His Excellency um, Governor Shea Martin, the, the Executive Governor of your State, with um, both sides and some key stakeholders up till late in the night um, yesterday. Um, some of them had also put the um, issue of leadership in the market as one of the remote um, causes. And um, in that meeting, a lot of agreements had been reached um, the way the, the, the so-called young people who want to take reign of leadership in the market had pushed the people of the, that had been running the market aside. They said, look, um, this market had been there for 40, 50 years. And then we had the, uh, you know, joint leadership of the Ballet of Shasha and the Serki of Shasha, you know, administering things. And some young people came um, to say they want to take the leadership um, of the market. So they, they, they make the leadership, the, the market to look as if there is no leader now. And everything, what is behind it is about what they can make out of all sorts of uh, tickets and uh, revenue they, they collect in the market. And uh, looking at this, uh, the elders had um, agreed to work together I, I believe um, because some frank talk um, was made yesterday and uh, it is believed that uh, this will help. Uh, it's not as if uh, the market is new. Um, so moving on, structures are being put in place. Um, immediate um, uh, assistance um, is being worked out uh, for people uh, that have suffered uh, losses. We know that lives cannot be replaced, but um, His Excellency Governor Shei Makide, and of course, you listen to Governor Kerry Dolu as well. You have people in Shasha Market, in some part of your state, that are from the north who cannot even speak healthy language. <laughs> that their grandparents will be there, their great great grandparents. So, when we talk of, oh, let us separate, we also have to look into that. Some of the houses that were bought, you'll find out that. Um, Yoruba man is the landlord, Ausas are the tenant. In some of them, um, Ausa is the landlord, Yorubas are the tenants. So how do we really separate this? We shouldn't head towards Rwanda. And that is what um, the governor of Oyo State has been preaching, that um, all these things that uh, appear to be part of the deep-rooted animosity, which cannot be solved only in Oyo State, is a general thing in the country for now. But the ones that we can solve, um, leadership of the market, um, how to also um, ensure that those guys that are infiltrated into the market, because the Bowser community had said, most of the guys that started that uh, fell this trouble, uh, they're just boys that um, either from Nijay, Chad, or whatever, that had no nothing doing in that market. Um, so efforts have been made to see how these people can be profiled. Um, so that the traders, the traders want to go back to business. They want to live in peace as they've been doing. Um, so all these measures have been put in place. I strongly believe that um, with sincerity of uh, purpose and sincerity of mind of um, everyone that is taking part in, in this talk, um, all right, we, we should be... It is believed that um, this um, would help uh, in a way but I follow in line with uh, what their excellencies, um, the governor of Ondo State and uh, the governor of Oyo State um, said yesterday. 
we should do everything in our power. Um, yes, as a government, we are trying to do that. But um, as a people, and to some of us that have the responsibilities to send the narratives out there, to avoid anything that we make us to lose any additional life or have any um, additional destruction, it is already a bad situation. It's been addressed, but we should be somehow modest in the narratives um, we give out. And um, like uh, the governor of Ohio State had always said, um, something that was unusual yesterday was uh, the government, the governors came out and the governor of Ohio State came out to say, we're very sorry. We know things have been bad. It cannot be fixed um, just um, you, you know, in a twinkle of, of an eye. So if um, you've seen a government that has said, oh, we're sorry for what has happened, the governor has always talked about limited opportunity. If you want to address the uh, problems in the country and in your state holistically, it's going to be a gradual process. Let's start with the um, low hanging fruit. We're talking of limited opportunity. How do we expand the economy um, in order to make sure that we, we put people out of the streets? Um, to, to an extent, um, we need to, to be patient. Um, all this fire brigade approach uh, will not help. And uh, if we're patient and uh, we allow governments all over the country um, with sincerity to, you know, broaden uh, uh, the, the uh, growth, development and everything so that this limited opportunity will be solved, we'll be able to, um, you, you know, have uh, people, we'll be able to stop all this uh, restiveness um, of different uh, gang. Uh, gangsters and all, all, all those things. Um, we, we must realize something. Um, at the end of the day, if we fight, if we kill, all over the world, um, at the end of the day, we'll come to uh, the table, the, the round table again. Should we kill? And if you uh, think it is about politics and whatever, if you use uh, all these games to win power, who are you going to rule over? And at the end of the day, the thing will still also come and face you whether you like it or not. So there are certain things we need to set out, you know, set aside all these political uh, considerations. There are serious issues in the country now. And the main one is this deep-seated animosity that is fanning the hamper of uh, ethnicity, um, religion, and all those other things. The issue of citizenship, um, indigenship, and uh, settlers as well. There are some countries that they don't care. How do you have a situation where I live in Kano State? Um, my third generation have lived in Kano State, and my children have been going to school there, and they want to write jump or whatever. You are saying that, oh, because you originated from Oyo State. Children that have not been to Oyo State before, you are saying that you will use the quota, um, the cutoff mark of Oyo State. Government should address this. We will not solve this problem if we don't live in sincerity. We should take all this ethnicity, state of origin. The, yes, we don't like making comparison. You live in the United States of America. It's the state where you pay your tax to. That is your state, for God's sake. But you come here, the first thing you say on the form is religion and um, state of origin. I, I think the people that we've entrusted the power to, to lead us, for once, should be sincere. We've not seen sincerity in, on the part of the people who've um, you know, given the trust to lead us, starting from the National Assembly. It seems as if the, 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 all of us, because any of us can find ourselves in it, we are speaking now. Who knows whether I get there? Who knows whether you get there? It's the same thing we come and repeat. So um, all of us must live in sincerity. And um, hopefully um, we'll be able to address this. Nigeria seems to be sitting on, it, on the kind of gunpowder, all the, the panels, whatever. What have we we done with the community? What have we done with the recommendations? Uh, people will go around, will spend money doing something that is like jamboree, and no one will go back to, you know, to institutional memory. Let us compile this. What have we not done out of these recommendations? Far-reaching recommendations have been made in the past on all these things. No, nobody cares. The government goes, um, another government comes, they, everybody wants to tie whatever he has done to his name, for God's sake. 
not it's not as if they use their past memory. Um, someone is doing this project, it is tied to this person. So um, you know, your state, um, we, we, we want to move on. We want to ensure that people are able to um, live peacefully. But the governor is looking at the, those low-hanging fruits. What can we do immediately? Um, how can we gradually solve um, all these things that are the systemic that have been living with us? But can we do, in, do it in isolation? No. All over Nigeria now, there is no state in this country that would say that is um, having peace. There is no state in this country that people are not living in fear that tomorrow some people can come and say, you are not from here. The ones that are not having this um, ethnic um, problem, it is mandatory everywhere. I, I think sincerity um, yeah. should uh, take the, 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 for the forefront uh, mm. and the mind of the people that we've entrusted, um, you know, this power to, to lead us. Well, j just just before we uh, sign out in uh, in this conversation, Mr. Oshidi, you what you are saying essentially is that we have uh, a varied number of reasons for which you have insecurity in all sectors of the nation. But at the end of the day, security or a lack of it is about people. Now, let's drill this down now. All the lofty ideals, ideas, programs, policies of government that you have talked about in your state now, fantastic, some would say. But percolating those ideals down to the people is the issue. And where we have large gatherings of people, such as the markets, until the people take ownership of these issues, there is going to be the problem. From time to time, it could raise ugly head. How do we nip that in the bud? For instance, this market now, uh, some have thought about, wait a minute, why don't we have soft structures such that, okay, uh, everyone knows everyone. So when you notice a strange person coming into the environment, you already quickly, you know, address that person, find out who the person is so uh, it doesn't become an insecurity issue. Is that part of the plan along the line of getting the issue of security ownership down to the brass tacks. If you followed um, the executive governor of Oyo State, His Excellency Governor Shei Makinde, the issue of identity um, management is uh, one of the key things that the, the state is pursuing. Yes, there are issues as to <clears throat> what is allowed by the federal government, what can the state do on its own. So they want the state can do it on its own. Um, the state is doing it. I'm putting up the structure um, somehow as well. If you've also followed uh, uh, follows Governor Shei Makinde, um, you, you know, with him emphasizing this limited opportunity, um, he, he has um, been adopting this style of look, people must hone their actions, people must live responsibly, that it is not about carrying cordial, carrying guns to pursue people to. Um, make them to obey the law. That when people buy into the law, um, it will be easy. You won't have to expend so much money. We expend so much money in enforcement. And of course, even um, in the whole criminal justice administration, the courts are not enough, the judges are not enough. So the state is trying to, you know, see how the, the mind of the people can be attuned to build responsible citizens. And that is why the governor has always emphasized, oh, people must own their action. Um, people must buy into the measures put in place by government. And once you have that, honestly, one of the reasons I had always talked, um, you, you know, saying that I'm pessimistic about uh, community policing is that um, it's not as if we don't have it before. We, we've been having community policy, but you can't put something on nothing. All the countries we are helping, all the countries we are copying, the citizens already have and recognize and live to the truth that there is what they call civic obligation of the citizen. We don't have it in the country. If you don't have a people um, recognizing that they have a civic obligation, that think that everything that is done to help government, to help law enforcement, they must be paid for it. You cannot have a successful, um, so in, in, you know, um, practice. Yeah, as, as you wind down on this one, do you see any role 
for our lawmakers, both at the federal and state level? Oh, seriously. Seriously, that must well. That is why I keep on emphasizing. What, as many of the lawmakers talk about that um, chapter two of the Constitution, I strongly believe, uh, that's my own personal belief, that if we live true to that, that is the area our lawmakers, from the National Assembly to the state, should be talking about. The, the, that provision has said that you, you that they set up the fundamental obligations of the government, the obligations of the people itself, economic objectives that people must be provided with work, people must be given medical attention, um, people that are working must be given living wages, that no one in this country should suffer. As any of our lawmakers really even today even know or have asked their mind to that, you've not seen any robust debate on that. So they have a huge role to play. Most of the things they will always talk about are those ephemeral things that um, that seems to be things personal to them. No, we we not have a good country if we continue like that. All right, uh, Mr. Fatale Wosh, any uh, special advisor to the governor of your state on security matters, as well as a former commissioner of police in Lagos and Benue states. Thank you for talking to us today on the program. All right, then uh, we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Well, it's still him. It might look a little older. We'll come to the question of his age much later. But we're going to be dealing with weightier issues this morning. We're being joined by Senate Minority Leader, who is Senator Einaya Abaribe. Distinguished, you're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure to be here. Pretty heavy matters at hand. Um, and I think that you... You, when I mean you, I mean the Senate set the tone for that discussion uh, when they resumed plenary last week. Uh, one of the matters that came up, in fact, the first and primary matter that came up, sponsored by 107 senators we gathered, uh, is a bill titled General Insecurity in Nigeria. And we saw how heated the debate got on the floor of the Senate. And it's been, it continues to be a source for concern. I mean, our earlier guest, uh, you know, sh sh talked about uh, some of the aftermath when we saw what happened in Ibadan over the weekend. Uh, there were disturbing visuals. Oh, I don't know if you got to see them. Yes, I did. Uh, of what happened in the southeast as well of the country. Uh, well, I don't know if what happened in Lagos is related to it, but we also saw what happened in Lagos as well, even though some would say that's another kettle of fish. But generally... You know, the wave still exists, that general wave, that general feeling of insecurity across the country. And we see different warnings uh, on the front pages this morning. Are you satisfied, first, with the level of debate that was had on the floor of the Senate? Where, where your brother senators, brother and sister senators, able to reach a consensus as to the way forward? Yes, um, I, I think we reached a consensus, the consensus being an admission of the fact that we have insecurity everywhere and we need to talk about it, we need to find ways to diffuse the tension. And an admission also that we are at a precipice and that if Patriots don't come together to head off uh, this looming disaster in front of us, that we may just all not have a country. So that was what was agreed. Now, uh, the next, of course, after that uh, admission, the next step is what do we do? Who has the responsibility? And um, where would the responsibility lie? I, th I think one of the unfortunate things that we have seen is when people who have the primary response, which is government and their agents, come out and now say, oh, it's not our response, it's the response of everyone. You know, when you hear such things, then the, the feeling you get is that they don't want to accept the reality of what is facing us. The job of a chief executive 
is to drive the goals of the particular organization. Same as government. And so, what the government ought to do is to say, okay, we're taking these steps. Step one, step two, these are the uh, immediate things we're going to do. These are the uh, longer term things we are supposed to do so that all of us will get to a particular destination, which is security and welfare of the people. And so when people now turn around and want to outsource their responsibility, let me just put it that way, we get very worried. And so that is where we are at the moment in the Senate. You say that one of the ways, one of the solutions you reached on the floor of the Senate is that, you know, tension needs to be diffused. Precisely. Um, if that is the case, what exactly, I mean, are, are you agreed, are you all agreed on the ways and manner to diffuse this tension? Because some people will argue that when government says it is not only our responsibility, it is because they believe that even the words that we utter as individuals and as a collective at this point could either aggravate matters or could diffuse them. What are some of the ways that the Senate is thinking of this diffusion? Obviously, so some of the things we say would, if you looked at that debate, in the midst of the debate, one of my colleagues, a very well-respected person, now said, oh, a governor has no right to send other citizens away from his state and all that. And I, I got up and I said, I think you're sending the wrong message. The job of a chief executive of a state, part of it is, of course, the security of the state. And if he sees that there are criminal elements somewhere and he says, what is the solution here? How do you get rid of this criminal element? I said, okay, so we're going to profile everybody. We're going to tell people that, okay, so if you're going to stay here, then we need to know who you are. And then somebody says, oh, he wants to send us away. So that sends the wrong message. It now looks as if you're profiling a particular um, ethnic uh, group and so forth. And so, uh, like I said, we recognize all this. And the job of every patriot, starting from the president of Nigeria, is to es de-escalate tensions. And uh, in another interview, I had uh, posited a particular position that was uh, uh, provided by uh, our revered uh, Wole Shoink. And he says, the president needs to come out and say, I do not, you understand, I do not support this type of actions, this criminal elements, and so forth. And he has to come out and see, and everybody sees that he's owning this problem and saying, no, we, we can't do it. We can't take it anymore. We can have criminal people coming into this country and then, and then second step uh, after sorry, that. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you there. Yes. Are you taking it, should we take it that failure to do that means that his silence is enabling those who are perpetrating this? Is that what we're insinuating? Well, what you're doing is putting words in my mouth, but I can ask you too the same question. If you, as a chief executive of a country, you're being ravaged by foreign elements, as you claim, why won't you come out and say it? Why won't you turn around and say, we cannot take this. I'm giving marching orders to all the security agencies and all that, that this cannot happen anymore. Hasn't it done that already? No. We have never heard it. All that we heard, which the spokesman of the president, I listened to him on this program, where he said this president has been talking about it. And when you ask, where did the president ever say, this criminal husband will never be tolerated in this country? Where? 
We don't hear it. What we heard from the inception, from 2016 all the way down is, oh, live in peace with your neighbor, and try to accommodate your countrymen, you know, and stuff of that nature. And that now enables those who are committing these crimes that there is no punishment. And, you know, when you see the rest of the country, uh, eruptions here and there, all targeted at a particular segment of people, you should be very worried. Hmm. Yes, you should be very worried. And why you should be very worried is, what is it that gives these people the impetus to continue to commit these crimes? And I can posit a, a couple of examples. Governor Autumn recently did a press interview and I watched it and he said, people came and committed mayhem a mother. A particular group, the Mieti Allah, came up and said, we did this because we were responding to, or we were doing revenge. And nothing happened to them. Nothing. What do you think that members of that group will feel? Meanwhile, short time later, uh, um, I think it was sometime last year, Obidai Malaifa was talking about his people in Kaduna State being murdered and all that. And all of a sudden, he's picked up by the DSS. And what was, what was he picked up? Oh, that he's fomenting crisis and trouble. Well, he said something, actually. Yes, he did. He was picked up for his comments. That is what I'm saying. Yes. But some people came out on television and said, we committed a crime and nothing happened to them. And that is what is making everybody feel that there are two levels of justice. And you can't have that in one nation. If you have two levels of justice, then people would say, okay, if the federal government is no longer protecting us and we are being slaughtered. One, one, one was you know, an allegation. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not privy to, I mean, that what Governor Autumn said um, about Mieti Ala Kauta Hori, and he's always very specific about which Mieti Ala you know, it's come, it's, has said what? But for some people, they'll say that it was the governors themselves who were after uh, Mr. Omi Lafia because he did say that some governors were sponsoring Boko Haram. That was a categorical allegation. But, I mean, we'll definitely delve into it a bit more when we come back from this break. Please stay with us. Just before we went on break, Senator, we're talking about, you were talking about the two it would seem two different um, measures being put in place for two different cadres. So some people will argue uh, that those are two different scenarios. I think that's the point I was trying to make before we went on. I was trying to point out uh, in the example that you gave. Nonetheless, I'm wondering, what are we supposed to be doing right now? Um, we can see in the papers, Governor speaking about um, different measures. I, I'm curious, first and foremost, because you made reference to your colleague on the floor of the Senate, and some people will say that despite all that has been done by the uh, governors of Ondo, um, Ekiti, we also saw the governor of Zamfara, I think Jigawa as well, uh, in Ondo State to hold a meeting and, you know, try to talk to the people to explain uh, what he was trying to say. Uh, it was seen that 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 distrust, the suspicion, is still there. That's why we will get comments uh, like we got from the governor of Bochy State and that we also got from your colleague on the floor of the Senate. It would seem that what is being said and what is being heard are two different things. How do we begin to reconcile, uh, you know, so that we can hear one, one another better? Because so far, so good. The argument is that the insecurity that is in the South is also present in the North. I think basically the insecurity is everywhere. It's even more in the North than 
in the south. And all, it looks as if it's just drifting down and everybody's worried. I think the real problem we have is being able to accept the reality. Yeah, I, I, and I, I need to put it in, in um, context. If a governor now comes out and says, everyone who is of a particular tribe, you understand, is welcome to Nigeria. And I have relatives all over West Africa. So why do we not have a nation state? And when statements of that nature are made, what is sense and what people hear actually is anybody can come to Nigeria, take over somebody's property, land, and drive the whoever is an indigent there away. So such statements, when you make them, you don't know the reverberations that it will bring. That's why we said that sometimes people need to be a little more circumspect before they make uh, certain statements. And because some of these things have been said and things have been done without care, all that he has done is that he has brought a reaction from people to say, okay, if this is what it is, so let us respond. And of course, it is the response that will lead to so much problems within the country. And so my advice will be that people should think before they talk. And some of the statements that we heard from uh, some of these, uh, from what we can see in the newspapers this morning, it means that people were not really thinking. So how can you now wake and say, oh, nothing belongs to anybody? Meanwhile, you are a governor hmm. who under the Land Use Act, you're supposed to supervise and have that land in your, as your responsibility to use as may be required by the people of your state. Now, I, I you think I, as much as possible, I, I mean, until we get clarification from Governor Bala Mohammed as to you know, what he was trying to say when he says, oh, the forests uh, are God's gift. Some people will say, well, yes, when you're driving through Nigeria and you're looking at the hills and the valleys and the mountains, what you're actually doing is praising God because you know that it's, it's his free gift to all of mankind to, to enjoy for generations to come. Nonetheless, you know, as you said, the states have been earmarked and, and uh, as such, governors have responsibility to states. Well, let's push that comment aside and say, we'll put it in the silo. The others, in terms of the general insecurity, the fact that in Zamfara State, you have suffered the insecurity that our brothers down south in Ondo State, for instance, have suffered, <coughs> that in Kaduna State, in the last one or two weeks, uh, close to 100 people, if not more, have lost their lives. At least over, the, over two or three days, we had about 52 people uh, losing their lives you know, needlessly. Um, under circumstances that really nobody can explain. Uh, these are, these are, this is a reality. Uh, and if you come down south too, I mean, uh, Niger is not really south, but even just yesterday, 18 people were kidnapped, uh, you know, tra traveling to wherever it was that they were traveling to. There is a general insecurity in the country. Why would it seem that this has now been explained as either farmer herders crisis or the rampage of Fulani herdsmen. Some people say that is what is causing the tension. The fact that, you know, uh, instead of profiling the crime, we are profiling the people whom we suspect are committing the crimes. And that's why we're getting situations like what we're seeing in Ibadan, in you know, your state, for, for instance. Do you see the link there? I'm a little confused <laughs> by what you're saying when you say instead of profiling the crime. A, a crime is done by someone. And 
You know, at every point that you need to make explanations for a particular situation, the best thing to do is always to go back to basics so that if you take all the building blocks, you now know how you can resolve the issue. At first, the government refused to acknowledge that there were people who came from elsewhere and were attacking our people and killing them. And it's still happening. So when you say some people were killed in um, uh, Kaduna, people were killed in uh, Niger, people were killed in Zamfara, who are those doing this killing? We ought to have known by now because it's been a long drawn out issue. And because we were not taking it, it was being explained in different ways and government was bending his back to explain away all these deaths. And so, right now, Nigerians no longer believe whatever government says. Because at the point at which you start by saying, oh, it may have been farmer headers clash, and it turned out not to be. Oh, it may have been people blocking grazing routes. And he said, oh, it no longer turns out to, oh, it is now people who came from Libya after the conflict there. And it's no longer, so, oh, it is the desertification happening all over the Sahel region that is making people push down and say, oh, oh no, it's not that. It is that some people have a way of life and therefore they must move. And so if you block them or something, then they will res respond, you know. So it is all this effort at explaining away destruction of the livelihoods of people in different places. And so eventually, what now started to happen was people now started seeing, oh, so they clear off people here, kill them, and then some people start living there. What does that tell you? It means that there is an agenda behind this is no longer a random thing. And so everybody is really very, very worried. In fact, why I get so worried is that if you leave your primary responsibility, which, like I continue to say, is the welfare and security of Nigerians, and at all times you try to provide an excuse, what you do is to enable those who are committing this mayhem. That is why on the floor of the Senate, if you saw the clip, I said, a man who gets up and now is a living in the bush somewhere, and every time you see that there is kidnapping here, and the people are taken into the bush, ransom is paid, then you can know, you, you don't need any other person to tell you that he is using, uh, doing the uh, heads, uh, men uh, business to commit another crime. And I think the other day I also read where Governor Erufai rightly said, that any header who has engaged in kidnapping we no longer go back to heading because what is he, he, he makes far more money from that. I, I can understand the frustration of governors, especially those from Zamfara, Casina, all that. What do they do? And so they were forced to say, okay, let us negotiate, seeing whether these people can ease the pressure on our people. And of course, those people that they are supposed to protect, for which they are doing, going, bending backwards. Even Governor El Refai at some point came under fire. Precisely, for, 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 for all that. Of course, he, he, you can see his position today is no more. Because haven't done it and it's not working. Uh, what, what we expect is that every other governor should, they should also all sit and say, what are the solutions? Which one has worked? Which one has not worked? Let us see how we can resolve this issue. But because each government of this federation does not have the capacity to have its own uh, uh, 
control of the military, the police, the air force, and all that, it comes back to the federal government. So we always expect that the federal government will take the lead in resolving this issue or making a headway. Okay. And so when they now brought in new people, I said, okay, let's see whether the new people will do better. Well, we do have a representative of the federal government online, uh, Chamberlain. Oh, yes, we've got Gaba Sheryl, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. Well, unfortunately, these scenarios are playing up in different parts of the country. The most recent happens to be that in Ibadan. But there are huge concerns about the role of the federal government. I mean, several people have said government, the federal government is not doing what it ought to do to address those problems. And that's why people think they can take laws into their hands. Some people say they're absorbing uh, certain persons from uh, at least facing the full wrath of the law. So, yes, you released a statement uh, not long ago, but could you tell us what practical steps is the presidency thinking about or are they going to be taking to ensure that whoever is found to be violating the laws in any part of the country faces the law? So uh, the president is uh, more than concerned about the ongoing situation. And uh, he is fully conscious of the fact that it is the responsibility of his government to work with all Nigerians to secure life and uh, to stop uh, the ongoing you know, crisis, whether they are kidnappings or now the, the, the new line of it is uh, uh, ethnic uh, hatred and violence. Uh, he condemns it and does not support it. And the fact now is, having spoken against it, condemned it, it follows that um, all security agencies must take their line of action from the president's mark and do that which is necessary, which is to stop the escalation of this uh, mutation of violence that has, has, has been witnessed in some parts of the country and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ensure that it does not go beyond where it has been recorded. And secondly, also, it is, it is for community leaders, everyone local uh, and traditional and, and the elected people, they, they must work with the president. Uh, I have had the senators saying so much that is untrue about the president. And this is not how to solve the problem. When some actors in, in the country, in the political space, Get him, look, there is no big criminal in this country without a big man behind him. When you unlock the door for, for one of the country's biggest criminals to bolt away, and then you go, you, you convince the judge that, uh, no, it is the army that let him go. So you that bailed him, what, there must be trust between yourselves. Bring him back, let him come and face justice. So to now say president is doing nothing, is because the, because there is impunity. Impunity is in the country because they are big men, VIPs. Yeah. But 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 Mr. Gaba, you if if you could go. um speak to this impression that a lot of people hold out there. I mean I mean the people who we've heard say that to us off the camera. Uh, first they talk about uh, herdsmen of uh, Fulan extraction who bear AK forty seven. They talk about herdsmen or full and extraction, whether they're from outside the country, who are kidnapping people. And then giving the real full and herdsmen a bad name, and people can't usually separate some of this, and so they lump everybody together. How is the presidency dealing with that narrative? Because the, so there's a school of thought that believes that the government is not addressing that specifically. Let me tell you that the country's military, as we speak, as a matter of fact, is overstretched because they are active in at least 34 of the 36 states of the Federation, including the FCT. The Air Force, the, 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 the police, they are recruiting day and night. People are being trained in special operations and they're being sent to the forest. So being complicated. It's just a, 
we, we seem to have uh, lost uh, your feed, uh, Mr. Shu, but uh, let's toss to Abuja before we sort that out and come back to you in a moment. Magwe. Well, you heard the accusation there. I mean, he was very categorical when he talked about, well, maybe he didn't mention your name, but I'm sure that you were very sh sure and clear that he was referring to the fact that you stood bail uh, for Nam Dekano, who is nowhere to be found as we speak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I never expected anything else. I, actually, you see, this is just one of the things that make it difficult for us to have a conversation for a country that is undergoing this type of problems that we are undergoing. At every point you want to have a conversation, then somebody from the presidency turns around and becomes personal. You understand. And, and let, let me uh, uh, um, educate uh, Garba Shehu. A judge said, you need a senator to stand shorty. And I did. And the military attacked the man before the day he was to come to court. And he escaped for his life. Then turning around, oh, you, you, you stood shorty uh, for a criminal. What makes him a criminal? That is carrying flag and saying, I want another country. Is he carrying AK-47 in the bush and kidnapping people and killing people? So that is why it's always very difficult to have a conversation. The reason is that at all times, when you want to have this conversation, there's, there's a fallback to, uh, okay, this is the situation, so why should well, we, we listen well, to well, what's you? We kind of run, what, what we kind of run away from right now is that there is a rhetoric of hate, a rhetoric of suspicion, a rhetoric of distrust, that is prevalent even amongst the elite. I mean, this morning we're seeing in one of the papers, governors at war. That is also there uh, on, right on the front pages. And we're beginning to see the results of the hate, of the suspicion, and of the distrust being manifest, uh, as we saw in Shasha, in Ibadan, as we also saw in some parts of the, of the East, even though that has not been confirmed, the video clips we saw, of people called the Eastern Security Network going to the bushes and burning settlements of you know, perceived enemies. Isn't that a problem? I think it is. And I think that what we need to do is always to have a conversation to be able to lower this tension. It is not a conversation of one person always pointing accusing fingers on people when suggestions are being made on how to de-escalate the tension that we have. It is this insensitivity that is leading everybody to say, okay, if you're not willing to listen to me, let me arm myself. That is all that we are seeing. Uh, I, I am very happy that uh, Garbashe who said, the president is concerned. So fine, he is concerned. Can he come out and tell Nigerians, I am concerned? That is what Wole Shoyinka recommended. Well, let's, let's go to Lagos now, and I think we can pose that question to the president's spokesperson, Chamberlain. Well, yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Shehu, can you just go straight and address that one? The president is concerned clearly, but people want to hear him, not just through a statement, but through his face and voice. Unmute yourself. Please unmute, you know, your, your device so we can hear you better. When Femi Adeshina or myself speak for the president, people should accept that it is the president that is speaking. For the president, for this president, for him, it is the actions that should speak for him. He's not a showman. He doesn't have to be there. And for God's sake, Let's be understood. We're not trying to personalize anything. Senator Abaribe dwelled a lot attacking President Buhari, saying that President had never, even at a rhetorical level, 
spoken against this kind of violence, that is most uncharitable. So we are not personalizing. People should not personalize. This country has problems. It requires the involvement of everyone. All hands must be on the deck to solve these problems. Yes. Community well, leaders have a role. Senators have a role. Everyone yeah. has a role. Yeah. Well, talking about the roles of people, some expect some very strong uh, voice from the president, both in words and in body language. A number of people would say that sometimes it's the body language of the president that is communicating something wrong. For instance, uh, there's a reference that uh, Senator Baribe made to a segment of Mieti Allah that took ownership of a reprisal attack and nothing happened to them. So, how, how, how do you respond to that one? I think the problem is that uh, we are not following up our stories as media. Otherwise, if you know the thousands of people, and I hope the police command will take, the headquarters of the police will take responsibility and publish the full list of Fulani herders who are undergoing trial in various states, particularly in Benue State. The thing about some of the media is that we are there on day one when the charge is read, and then we turn our back, we move on. But trials are going on, convictions are being made, and the president cannot be complicit. He's very uncharitable, cannot be complicit in the kind of things that are being said of you. Well, but that is just one of several issues that have been addressed. There are also those who feel like, look, uh, for instance, we asked a political uh, science professor who said that for the security agencies to do their job, they need the political will. And, you know, the, a good question will be, whose political will? What's your take on that? Is that to say that the security agencies do not want to do their jobs or that they are waiting for the, the president or presidency to agree that they should do their jobs? It's happening. And, uh, and, uh, and begin to be appreciative of the enormous risks that our security people are taking. They are making it possible for you and I to sleep well because they are exposing themselves on the front lines. So for anybody to say there is no political will, is anybody complaining? Is the IGO police saying he's unable to do his job because he doesn't have support? Look, this president allows you to do your job. Look, people have been found complicit in a lot of wrongdoing in this country. Contract and or the president will never call, say, a minister and say, give this contract to this or that person. So you have the most powerful people in government running the various government departments because the president is not meddlesome. So what does he mean by political will? Well, maybe political will because there are also other layers of government, local, state, and, and at the federal level, uh, VIPs who they don't want to offend. Th then that is the problem. But nobody would do their job right, and then the president will disown them. It has not happened. It will not happen. All right, then, um, Mr. Gabasho, we do appreciate your perspective this morning. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you very much. All right, Makwa, let's get the concluding thoughts of the senator. Yeah, your concluding comments. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, you know, ask you whether or not you would also accept that when the president's spokesperson speak, it's as good as the president. Well, I don't know where in the world that when a spokesperson speaks, then is the president, when there are urgent matters of state. When things are um, okay and things, of course, the uh, presidential spokesman could be giving you updates and so forth. But you could see just from the coronavirus issue, no head of state in the world did not come out to talk to their people, none. And some were doing it almost on a daily basis. The insecurity that we are facing is also one of the most critical things that we are facing in Nigeria at the moment. And one would have expected that the president will not be detached and then saying, okay, just talk to us, whatever. Uh, you know, the spokesman say that that is it. But if that is what they call his style, I think that is not such a very good style for the thing that we are facing today. Mm. Well, 
we understand that you're going to be releasing a book very soon. I uh, wonder what, I can't wait to see what will be inside the book. Um, but um, after how many years in public service um, and still going on, uh, just to have some years left by God's grace, um, will, you, will all of this be chronicled in the book? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting from my childhood to this point. And I'm 66. So I was an independence baby. I was five years when we had the independence at, you know, in October 1960. And so, and there, there are a few vignettes, a few stories that are told inside there of the possibilities of Nigeria. I told a story about how I became a staff of the Bendel State University. Mm. I never knew anybody. Mm. I just did an interview. The interview was conducted by the head of department that time, Professor Lambo, who used to be a minister. How I became a staff of SEO through a man called Efatu Roti. I'm just I mean, th those are the things. Nigeria was better. Are you still hopeful for this country? Of course. Okay, it's of a fine Of course, place. I still hope that Nigeria will go back to that, where we don't need somebody calling me to say, please give me a letter so that I can go and get a job. It's a fine place to live it, uh, <laughs> Senator. I certainly look forward to the uh, release of that book and the stories that will be written in it. But we have to thank you so much for coming on this morning. It's Senate, my pleasure. Senator Enaya Abaribe is the Senate Minority Leader. Well, we have a few of your comments. Professor Enakena is talking about flushing out criminals. If we adopt subjective view because of ethnocentric and religious stance, we'll miss the mark to flush out these criminal elements and dislodged insurgents who are hiding under the umbrella of herding. Kidnapping has become a business for these delinquent supposed herders. That's what uh, Prof has to say. I quite agree with Senator Abaribe in the area of decisiveness of federal government in tackling the issue of Miyati Allah, especially on their constant offensive utterances. Government must not be perceived sectional in approaching national insecurity. Huwavi says the general feeling of despair, helplessness, and absence of citizenship are born out of serious have born upon out a serious dent in people's expectations and so many others. Uh, Abdul Kadir Nasidi, Ayotunde Richard, Musa Mohammed, Isyama Chibulu, and so many others. Thank you so much for your comments. Nakwe? Thanks for watching the program this morning, this wonderful Monday morning. I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf, wishing you a happy post Valentine. Yeah, do show some love. We could all do with some love right now as we speak. Oh, yes, indeed. So, Abdul Kader, Ayotunde, and several other people who have sent us a message or two. We do thank you all, and we hope you keep them coming. Spread the love. <laughs> I'm Ayo Makinde. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, tempted to read more. I'm Shane Bellamy, so goodbye. <laughs>